on this last day of the June 98 seven day retreat, I will read from old and contemporary teachers, tradition, Zen tradition and no tradition, and also some poetry, the sections from teachings have mostly been abbreviated, abridged, words left out or paragraph sentences, because this is not a presentation of these teachers, but picking what fits so well into what we're doing here in new words. One can get kind of used to the same words for seven days. I hope it won't be too long. Usually people don't complain. One time we did have a complaint. <laughs> <laughs> and I take all these things very seriously, so the readings shrunk. <laughs> and then people complained, why, did you read why didn't you read this or that? I was waiting for this. So it has expanded again, as you can see. <laughs> have time to find much new, although here and there you'll notice if you've come here frequently there is something new or different. But maybe all of us when we go to a concert we love to hear the old tunes. <laughs> and particularly with this material, something can suddenly dawn, one has never heard it before. To me, this is always new. First selections are from Huang Po. This book is called Zen Teaching of Huang Po, translated by John Blofeld, written down by his disciple, Pen Su, who was also the governor of the province where Huang Po was teaching. He actually built his monastery and had him go there to, to do teaching and he was his disciple. It's a nice mixture of state and religion. <laughs> if you're not familiar with Buddhist terms, uh, Buddha does not just refer to the historical personage but truth, awakened being. And in Buddhism, there is talk of our Buddha nature, meaning that which we are beyond all thought and beyond all trials and tribulations. Beyond all division is Buddha nature. Awakened being. Our original Buddha nature is, in highest truth, devoid of any atom of objectivity. It is void, omnipresent, silent, pure. It is glorious and mysterious, peaceful joy. And that is all. Enter deeply into it by awakening to it, by awaking to it yourself. That which is before you is it, in all its fullness, utterly complete. There is naught beside. Even if you go through all the stages of progress toward Buddhahood, one by one, when at last you attain realization, you will only be realizing the Buddha nature which has been with you all the time. And by all the foregoing stages, you will have added to it nothing at all. You will come to look upon those eons of work and achievement as no better than unreal actions performed in a dream. 
That is why the Buddha said, I truly attained nothing from complete unexcelled enlightenment. Full understanding can come to you only through an inexpressible mystery. The approach to it is called the gateway of the stillness beyond all activity. If you wish to understand, know that a sudden comprehension comes when the mind is purged of all the clutter of conceptual and discriminatory thought activity. Those who seek the truth by means of intellect and learning by intellect and learning only get further and further away from it. Not till your thoughts cease all their branching here and there. Not till you abandon all thoughts of seeking for something will you be on the right road. Though others may talk of the way of the Buddhas as something to be reached by various pious practices and by scripture study, you must have nothing to do with such ideas. A perception sudden as blinking that subject and object are one will lead to a deeply mysterious wordless understanding. And by this understanding will you awake to the truth. Your true nature is something never lost to you, even in moments of delusion, nor is it gained at the moment of enlightenment. It depends on nothing and is attached to nothing. It is all pervading spotless beauty. It is the self-existent and uncreated absolute Absolute means depending on nothing. That's what the word means. Ah, it is a jewel beyond all price. When a sudden flash of thought occurs in your mind, when a sudden flash of thought occurs in your mind and you see it for a dream or an illusion, then you can enter into the state reached by the Buddhas of the past. Not that the Buddhas of the past really exist, or that the Buddhas of the future have not yet come into existence. Above all, have no longing to become a future Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> Your sole concern should be as thought succeeds thought to avoid clinging to any of them. Questioner, but how can we prevent ourselves from falling into the error of making distinctions between this and that? Like, I like this, I like that the naming, the judgments. That's what he's asking about. How can we prevent ourselves from falling into this error? <laughs> Wang Po, by realizing that though you eat the whole day through, no single grain has passed your lips and that a day's journey has not taken you a single step forward. Also, by uniformly abstaining from such notions as self and other. Do not permit the events of your daily lives to bind you, but never withdraw yourselves from them. Only by acting thus can you earn the title of a liberated one. No need titles. 
Avoid the error of thinking in terms of past, present, and future. The past has gone. The present is a fleeting moment. The future is not yet come. When you practice meditation, sit in the proper position, whatever is right for you. Stay perfectly tranquil, if you can. <laughs> <laughs> this next one is better. Do, <laughs> do not permit the least movement of your minds to disturb you. And what when we get disturbed? Where does it all take place? This alone is called liberation. Do not permit the least movement of your minds to disturb you. And someone later, a thousand years later, ad adds, and when disturbance occurs, what is it? What gets disturbed? Let it shine through. This alone is what is called liberation. Ah, he says, be diligent, be diligent. From a compilation of Krishnamurti's sayings at Krishnamurti Foundation in India, This one is from the Star Bulletin, 1930. The individual problem is the world problem. If the individual has found happiness, has created order within himself, then he will create order in the world around him and in helping others solve their own individual problems, he will help to solve the world problem. You think that in seeking the liberation of the self, there is the suggestion of egotism. You think that to be eternally happy is a selfish realization. You think that to be free from sorrow and strife is a desertion of the world. This is a misconception. Liberation is the very antithesis of the sense of the ego, of I-ness. It is the ultimate realization for all people. And eight years later in Ohio, I personally feel that the world is myself, that what I do creates either peace or sorrow in the world that is myself. And as long as I do not understand myself, I cannot bring peace to the world. So my immediate concern is myself, not selfishly, not merely to alter myself in order to gain greater happiness, greater sensations, greater successes. For as long as I do not understand myself, I must live in pain and sorrow and cannot discover enduring peace and happiness. from the flame, no, from a talk in Bombay, 1955. Questioner, what is the self-knowledge of which you speak and how can I acquire it? Krishnamurti, you have extraordinary ideas about self-knowledge, that to have self, to have self-knowledge you must practice, you must meditate, you must do all kinds of things. It is very simple, sir. He always says, just sir. The first step is the last step in self-knowledge. The beginning is the end. After all, to know yourself 
is to watch your behavior, your words, what you do in your everyday relationships. To watch your words, your behavior, what you do in your everyday relationships. To become aware of it, become transparent to it. That is all, he says. Begin with that and you will see how extraordinarily difficult it is to be aware. Just to watch the manner of your behavior, the words you use to your servant, to your boss, the attitude you have with regard to people, to ideas, to things. Just watch your thoughts, your motives, your motives. Watch our motives. In the mirror of relationship, watch your motives in the mirror of relationship, and you will see that the moment you watch, you want to correct. You say, this is good, that is bad. I must do this and not that. When you see yourself in the mirror of relationship, your approach is one of condemnation or justification. Therefore, you distort what you see. Whereas, if you simply observe in that mirror your attitude with regard to people, ideas and things, if you see that fact without judgment, without condemnation or acceptance, then you will find that that very perception has its own action. That is the beginning of self-knowledge. Two selections from the meditative mind passages for the study of the teachings of Krishnamurti. These are prepared by the KFA for gatherings there. Somebody sent me this. from the flame of attention. It is immensely important to, to know and to understand the depth and beauty of meditation. Human beings have always been asking from timeless time whether there is something beyond all thought, beyond all romantic inventions, beyond all time. Humans being, human beings have always been asking, is there something beyond all this suffering, beyond all this chaos, the wars, beyond the battle of human beings? Is there something that is immovable, sacred, utterly pure, untouched by any thought, by any experience? This has been the inquiry of serious people from the ancient of days. To find that out, to come upon it, meditation is necessary. Not the repetitive meditation that is utterly meaningless. There is a creative energy which is truly religious when the mind is free from all conflict, from all the travail of thought, to come upon that which has no beginning, no end. That is the real depth of meditation and the beauty of it. Somebody was asking in this retreat, can one bring this to children, some quietness? Actually, she is doing it with seven-year-olds. Three minutes of quiet sitting before school starts. Now, this is uh, from the beginnings of learning. These are talks of Krishnamurti with students at Brockwood School in England. These are high school students. When you sit very quietly, or lie down very quietly, the body is completely relaxed, isn't it? 
Have you ever tried to sit very, very quietly? Not to force it. Because the moment you force it, it is finished. To sit very quietly, either with your eyes closed or open. If you have your eyes open, there is a little more distraction. You begin to see things. So, after looking at things, the curve of the tree, the leaves, the bushes, after looking at it all with care, then close your eyes. Then you will not say to yourself, what's happening, let me look. First look at everything. The furniture, the color of the chair, the color of the sweater. Look at the shape of the tree. After having looked, the desire to look out is less. I've seen that blue sky. I've finished with it and won't look again. But you must first look, then you can sit quietly. When you sit quietly or lie down very quietly, the blood flows easily into your head, doesn't it? There's no strain. That's why they say you must sit cross-legged with head very straight, because the blood flows easier that way. If you sit crouched, it is more difficult for the blood to go into the head. So you sit or lie down very, very quietly. Don't force it. Don't fidget. If you fidget, then watch it. Don't say, I must not fidget. Then when you sit very quietly, watch your mind. First you watch the mind. Don't correct it. Don't say, this thought is good, that thought is not good. Just watch it. Then you will see that there is a watcher and the watched. There's a division. The moment there is a division, there is conflict. Now, can you watch without the watcher? Is there a watching without the watcher? It is the watcher that says, this is good and that is bad. I like this, but I don't like that. Or, I wish she hadn't said this. Or, I wish I had more food. To watch without the watcher, try it sometime. That's part of meditation. Just begin with that. That's good enough. And you will see, if you have done it, that an extraordinary thing takes place. Your body becomes very, very intelligent. Now the body is not intelligent because we have spoiled it. Do you understand what I mean? We have destroyed the natural intelligence of the body itself. Then you will find that the body says, go to bed at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> it wants it. It has its own intelligence and activity. And also, if it wants to be lazy, <coughs> let it be lazy. A section from I Am That by Nisargadatta, who was a contemporary of Krishnamurti, didn't get quite as old, died a bit earlier, lived in India all his life. Translated by Maurice Friedman. This is from a chapter called The Ever Present, an excerpt. Questioner asks, are you now in the present state? No. Are you now in the perfect state? Asks the questioner. Are you now in the perfect state? Nisagadatta. Perfection is a state of the mind when it is pure. I am beyond the mind, whatever its state, pure or impure. Awareness is my nature. Ultimately, 
I am beyond being and not being. Question it. Will meditation help me to reach your state? Nisargadatta. Meditation will help you to find your bonds, to loosen them, untie them, and cast your moorings. When you're no longer attached to anything, you have done your share. The rest will be done for you. Questioner, by whom? Nisargadatta. By the same power that brought you so far that prompted your heart to desire truth, your mind to seek it. It is the same power that keeps you alive. You may call it life or the supreme. Questioner. The same power kills me in due course. Nisagadatta. Were you not present at your birth? Will you not be present at your death? Find him who is always present and your problem of spontaneous and perfect response will be solved. Questioner. The realization of the eternal and an effortless and adequate response to the ever-changing temporary event are two different matters. Realization of the eternal and then the adequate response to the ever-changing are two different matters. You seem to roll them into one. What makes you do so? Realizing the ever-present and responding to the changing. What makes it one? Nisargadatta. To realize the eternal is to become the eternal. The whole. The universe. With all it contains. Every event is the effect and the expression of the whole. And is in fundamental harmony with the whole. Every event is the effect and the expression of the whole and is in fundamental harmony with the whole. All response from the whole must be right, effortless and instantaneous. It cannot be otherwise it is right, if it is right. Delayed response is wrong response. Thought, feeling and action must be one and simultaneous with the situation that calls for them. Thought, feeling, and action must be one and simultaneous with the situation that calls for them. Question, how does it come? Nisargadatta, I told you already. Find him who was present at your birth and will witness your death. Questioner, my father and mother? Isagadatta, yes, your father and mother, or father, mother, with a hyphen in it. The source from which you came. To solve a problem, you must trace it to its source. To solve a problem, you must trace it to its source. Only in the dissolution of the problem in the universal solvents of inquiry and dispassion can its right solution be found. He says the universal solvents of inquiry, inquiring, solving. Inquire into something and it's already changed. Hasn't it? Passage from Being and Becoming by Vimala Taka, a teacher who lives in India. She, she used to travel throughout the world. 
holding talks, retreats. Now she stays in India in two places. This was in Dalhousie. 1989 talks. Dialogues took place at Dalhousie in 1989. She says, we are talking about an alternative way of living, which is a meditative way of living. Acquire knowledge, let it flow through you. Let it be utilized in its relevant field without thought creating a knower. If we look at the roots of all human misery, we will find that misery is built upon our stupefaction. We do not know how to relate to the social structures and use them without identification without creating a sense of authority out of them. Structures are not sacred. It is only life that is sacred. Patterns have no sacredness. Whether you create them in the name of religion, spirituality or politics, it is the pattern-free, structure-free, virgin dynamism of life that is sacred, that is divine. Wherever we have touched it with thought, we have manipulated it. We have structured it. It has a utility, but not sanctity. It has a utility, but no authority. Knowledge itself has no power to bind you. It is the creation of the knower that is the obstacle. Me who knows is the obstacle. You have a beautiful, sensitive body, and the sensitivity gets in touch with their respective objects, and they bring sensations. Sensations are converted to electric impulses, and the brain interprets them. It's a marvelous process, what we call experiencing. Contact with the outside world through the senses, which are very delicate, very tender. It is quite hard and arduous work to keep your sensual system pure, healthy, supple and elastic. Let the experiences flow through the sensual system. Nothing wrong in a sensual sexual experience, but thought creates an experiencer and gets stuck in the experience and its likes and dislikes, its value structures, preferences, and so forth. <coughs> if the sensual contact with objects is allowed to flow through you without creating the experiencer or the experience, then the oneness of life manifesting itself into manyness does not get corrupted, does not lose its vitality, does not get mutilated. In the same way, you acquire knowledge and you appear as an individual playing the role of a father, a mother, a brother, a sister. You are one appearing as many. It's a beautiful way of putting it. One appearing as many, just as life is one. The tree with all the leaves, we said yesterday. <coughs> one appearing as many. <coughs> There's no identification with the fatherness, the sonness, the daughterness, the sisterness. And you don't tie so many knots inside, but play the roles sanely, completely, with the magnificence of an inner equipoise then your appearing as many shall not corrupt you. The word meditation has been identified with psychophysical exercises, with concentrations, with methods, techniques, kundalini, shakti paths. The word has been abused and misused in a callous way. No authority and no effort 
freedom from authority and freedom from the struggle of efforts. Efforts to get someplace, me getting someplace, that's effort. Once you know that these human-made enclosures are only to be lived in temporarily, then the sense of comparing yourself with others, he has a palace and I have a hut, he has millions and I have hundreds, the sense of comparison and the ambition for competition disappears. Your economic life becomes simple. No vanity, no pride about your scholarship, your erudition. Your social life becomes simple. You do not move around with a begging bowl for sympathy, acceptance, prestige, acknowledgement. A nice way, moving around with this begging bowl. <laughs> Reconcile to limitations to the enclosures you live and move in them. Can you see with me that effortlessness is the content of silence? Effortless is the content of silence. Silence is the inner unconditional freedom from the authority of the past. She doesn't say freedom from the past, but the authority of the past. Memory is there, but does it rule our lives? What we remember about each other, does it have authority to rule our lives? Silence is inner unconditional freedom from the authority of the past. And meditation has no repetition at all. It is moment to moment. In the moment of relating, you are living. In a moment of aloneness, you are dying. In relating, you are living. In aloneness, you are dying. It is living and dying, like inhaling and exhaling. To be alone is to die to the sense of being somebody or being something. Is not that the content of death and dying? To be alone is to die to the sense of being somebody, a sinner, a saint, holy, knowledgeable, respected, rich. To be alone is to die to be something, to being something according to the definition of society, according to the value structure of religions. Physically isolating yourself may not lead you to the aloneness. It may or it may not. It may not. That is what we're afraid of, dying to the sense of being somebody, dying to all the images we have built up about ourselves is being alone. The way we are tackling the theme may be unusual, unheard of to many. It is a non-conventional way, a non-traditional approach. But I am really grateful that life brings you and me together. Some poetry from The Enlightened Heart, edited by Stephen Mitchell. Rumi, 1207 to 1273. It's actually an Afghan, I think. Lived in the Middle East. I read it many times, I forget. Most people have read and love Rumi. I 
I have lived on the lip of insanity, wanting to know reasons, knocking on a door. It opens. I've been knocking from the inside. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. Outside the freezing desert night, this other night inside grows warm, kindling. Let the landscape be covered with thorny crust. We have a soft garden in here. The continents blasted. Cities and little towns, everything become a scorched, blackened ball. The news we hear is full of grief for that future. But the real news inside here is there's no news at all. Ryokan, 1758, 1830, one a Japanese hermit, monk. First days of spring, the sky is bright blue, the sun huge and warm. Everything is turning green. Carrying my monk's bowl, I walk to the village to beg for my daily meal. The children spot me at the temple gate and happily crowd around, dragging at my arms till I stop. I put my bowl on a white rock, hang my bag on a branch. First we braid grasses and play tug of war. Then we take turns singing and keeping a kick ball in the air. I kick the ball and they sing, they kick and I sing. Time is forgotten. The hours fly. People passing by point at me and laugh. Why are you acting like such a fool? I nod my head and don't answer. I could say something, but why? Do you want to know what's in my heart? From the beginning of time, just this, just this. In all ten directions of the universe, there's only one truth. When we see clearly, the great teachings are the same. What can ever be lost? What can be attained? If we attain something, it was there from the beginning of time. If we lose something, it is hiding somewhere near us. Look this ball in my pocket. Can you see how priceless it is? And this is from, translated by John Stevens, from One Rope, One Bowl. An evening dream, 
Everything must have been an illusion. I cannot explain clearly even one part of what I saw. Yet in the dream, it seemed as if the truth were right in front of my eyes. This morning, awake, is it not the same dream? The vicissitudes of this world are like the movements of the clouds. Fifty years of life are nothing but one long dream. Sparse rain. In my desolate hermitage at night, quietly I clutch my robe and lean against the empty window. Late at night, the faint sound of someone pounding rice. Dew drips from the bamboo onto the firewood pile, and the plants along the garden are also moist. Frogs croak in the distance, but then seem very close. Fireflies light low, then high. Wide awake, sleep is far off. Smoothing out the pillow, I let my thoughts drift. The rainy season is over. It is now clear. I go out. Green fields and green cool breezes everywhere. Unable to sleep, I hear the voice of a young deer rising from a mountain ridge. The branches that will be used for this autumn's firewood are still blooming. Please gather some summer grasses wet with dew and come visit me. Not much to offer you, just a lotus flower floating in a small jar of water. I stretch out for a nap in my little hut in the fields, in my little hut. In the fields, frog chant their songs and the birds in the bamboo grove sing along. A thief has stolen my pillow and cushion. Why did he break into my hermitage? The door is never locked. The night is ending and I sit alone by the window. A sparse rain falls gently against the bamboo grove. Lying on my grass pillow, dreaming about this dream world again. Lonely, fitful sleep. As I watch the children happily playing, without realizing it, my eyes fill with tears. Thinking about the people in this floating world far into the night, my sleeve is wet with tears. The thief left it behind, the moon at the window.
poems by Mary Oliver, contemporary poet. This is from White Pine, and it is called Work. How beautiful this morning was pasture pond. It had lain in the dark all night, catching the rain on its broad back. All day I work with the linen of words and the pins of punctuation. All day I hang out over a desk, grinding my teeth, staring. Then I sleep. Then I come out of the house, even before the sun is up, and walk back through the pine woods to pasture pond. from new and selected poems. I'm looking for is not in this book. I should have brought another book. Or read. Singapore. In Singapore, in the airport, a darkness was ripped from my eyes. In the women's restroom, one compartment stood open. A woman knelt there washing something in the white bowl. Disgust argued in my stomach and I felt in my pocket for my ticket. A poem should always have birds in it. Kingfishers say with their bold eyes and gaudy wings, rivers are pleasant and of course trees. A waterfall? Oh, but that's not possible, a fountain rising and falling. A person wants to stand in a happy place in a poem. When the woman turned, I could not answer her face. Her beauty and her embarrassment struggled together and neither could win. She smiled and I smiled. What kind of nonsense is this? Everybody needs a job. Yes, a person wants to stand in a happy place in a poem. But first we must watch her as she stares down at her labor, which is dull enough. She's washing the tops of the airport ashtrays, as big as hubcaps, with a blue rag. Her small hands turn the metal, scrubbing and rinsing. She does not work slowly nor quickly, but like a river. Her dark hair is like the wing of a bird. I don't doubt for a moment that she loves her life. And I want her to rise up from the crust and the slop and fly down to the river. 
this probably won't happen. But maybe it will. If the world were only pain and logic, who would want it? Of course it isn't. Neither do I mean anything miraculous, but only the light that can shine out of a life. I mean, the way she unfolded and refolded the blue cloth, the way her smile was only for my sake. I mean, the way this poem is filled with trees and birds. The Sun, Last Selection. Have you ever seen anything in your life more wonderful than the way the sun, every evening, relaxed and easy, floats toward the horizon and into the clouds or the hills or the rumpled sea and is gone? and how it slides again out of the blackness every morning on the other side of the world, like a red flower streaming upward on its heavenly oils, say, on a morning in early summer at its perfect imperial distance. And have you ever felt for anything such wild love do you think there is anywhere in any language a word billowing enough for the pleasure that fills you as the sun reaches out, as it warms you, as you stand there empty-handed? Or have you too turned from this world? Or have you too gone crazy for power, for things? We will end here for today.